So, what we were uh, doing earlier was this dominant pole compensation business and assuming that our op amp is like this. For now, what I will do is I will reverse the direction of the both the control sources because that is more reflective of reality. Now, you will get some uh, poles and we said that if let us say the two of them have to be happen to be not widely separated or close to each other, then uh, for dominant pole compensation you have to make one of those pole frequencies very low. So, that uh, the unity loop gain frequency falls below the other pole. Okay. So, if you have P 1 and P 2 what you do is basically let us say lower P 1 such that the unity loop gain frequency I will assume that this whole amplifier is used in a circuit like this. So, unity loop gain frequency will be the DC gain of the op amp divided by k times P 1 and this is how much should this be? This should be less than the second pole and in fact, it should be less by at least a factor of 2 or so. Okay. So, this is what we will do. So, this means that if let us say when you first design the op amp P 1 and P 2 happen to be something the unity loop gain frequency that you can have is definitely going to be smaller than P 2. Okay. So, that means that the bandwidth of the amplifier that you get the closed loop bandwidth will also be smaller than P 2, okay. is not it. So, this is one way of doing it and to do this all we have to do is just throw in another capacitor across this. So, that you get we want to be whatever value we want. Okay. Any questions about this? Yeah, yeah. This has to be done while designing the op amp. Okay. Assuming that our op amp has two stages like this, you have to add a capacitor to the output of the first stage between the output of the first stage and ground. Okay. Ah, actually, that is a very good question. So, what uh, I mean who knows what uh, anybody will do with your op amp. right? So, first we will assume that uh, people will make amplifiers with the op amp. Okay. Now, given the op amp people can put all kinds of uh, feedback networks here and this is possible and you can take any commercial op amp and always put a feedback network. So, that this becomes unstable that is definitely possible, but let us say like people are like more reasonable and then they will make only amplifiers with this. This is not necessarily the case. Okay. So, in this case what will you do? What will be your strategy? You are the op amp designer and people can buy your op amps and make all kinds of amplifiers with it. So, who knows what they will do? So, what will you design for? gain of uh, which gain of 1000. Right. Okay. So, you are saying that uh, V naught by V i will be less than 1000. So, let us say for arguments, huh? I mean people want V naught by V i is of less than 1000. So, you will do what? You will assume 1000 and do it. No, no, let us say okay. I mean maybe this is reasonable, but uh, then uh, what will you do? 
fine okay I will uh, okay you can also put a fine print saying do not use this for more than 1000 <laughs> we note by vi, but uh, what is it that you are going to do then assuming that the upper limit on the gain that you want to implement is 1000. But is that the worst case? I mean, you have to first evaluate what is the worst case. What is the worst case for stability? Huh? No, no. I want that. That's not that for stability, right? I want. I am designing an op amp, and uh, for customers who may do whatever they want with it, at least they'll design uh, amplifiers or whatever gains. Which is the worst case gain as far as stability is concerned? One k of one. Right, because the condition we want is a naught by k times p1 must be smaller than p2. So, what is the variable here? k, and this is uh, lesser than any quality. So, the smallest value of k is the concern. And what's the smallest value of k? One. At least we will assume that they'll make amplifiers. They'll not make attenuators with this. Although it's quite difficult to do. So, first of all, to make an amplifier of gain one, what will you do? How do you make an amplifier of gain 1 with this? R 2 should be 0, it is a short and R 1 I mean once R 2 is 0 this is irrelevant. So, it is not there. I did not show this circuit explicitly I think, but this is what is known as a voltage follower or a unity gain amplifier. So, this is the worst case. Okay. So, you will adjust your as I said this business of uh, adjusting P 1 to guarantee stability is known as frequency compensation. So, you do frequency compensation uh, for k equal to 1. Okay, this is not necessarily the case. So, like uh, somebody else said, the lowest value of the gain is what is of uh, concern. So, typically, many general purpose op amps, such as the ones you use in the lab, are what are known as unity gain compensated op amps. Okay, so that means that they have adjusted it so that when you build the unity gain amplifier, the phase margin of the feedback loop will be I do not know 50 degrees or 60 degrees or something that will be given in the data sheet. You can look at it, the data sheet will be many pages long and all these border plots everything will be given including the phase margin. Okay. So, if you realize a higher gain, it is actually not a problem because as far as stability is concerned, right? what will happen? So, if I use a higher gain, you have given me a unity gain compensated op amp and I design a amplifier of gain 10 with it. So, what will be the difference between the bandwidth will reduce that is all. So, for unity gain amplifier, I have a closed loop bandwidth of something and for a gain of 10, I will have a closed loop bandwidth that is 10 times smaller. Okay. So, that is the disadvantage in that because you have uh, uh, the designer had to evaluate some sort of worst case and design for it. And if you are not at that worst case, you get a suboptimal result. Okay. Whereas, if I if you already knew that I would design a closed loop amplifier of gain 10, you would compensate it exactly for that, it would be better. Okay. So, that is why there are also op amps which are not unity gain compensated. In fact, the data sheet will tell you it will be compensated for k greater than or equal to 25 or something. Okay. So, this is done because if you go on unity gain compensate this and if you are only going to use it for gain greater than 25, you will always get an excess of phase margin which was not necessary and then you will have a bandwidth that is 25 times smaller. So, instead if you want high gain at high frequencies with high bandwidth, you will compensate it only for that particular value of gain. Okay. So, there are both types, the lot of general purpose op amps are unity gain compensated because people will use it for everything and there are some uh, variants of the same which will also be compensated for gain greater than. 25. Okay. So, you can look up the web for these things you will see. I believe if you look up uh, these part numbers, you will probably see that they are closely related to each other, but one of them is unity gain compensated, one of them is not. I do not remember the part numbers exactly, I think they are these things. Okay. Now, when you are designing an IC, of course, that is a different thing. There is uh, one op amp, it is used for a specific purpose and you compensate it only for that particular application. Even if I have two identical op amps on the same chip, if they happen to have different feedback fractions around them, I will use different compensation capacitors for each of those things. Okay. Because there every every op amp is a special case. Right. Any other questions? 
So, but uh, this dominant pole compensation it works, but the problem is that if you had two poles, uh, the bandwidth will be less than the higher of the poles. Okay. Now, it turns out we can do dominant pole compensation or approximately so, but the bandwidth can be much more than this. The problem here is that we have two poles perhaps close to each other and what we can do is only lower one of them. Okay, The other one is not moving. It would be a lot better if you could do this. Let us say you move the higher frequency pole or one of the poles outwards and one of the poles inwards. Then your bandwidth will be better right? because bandwidth is related to the higher frequency non-dominant pole because the unity loop gain frequency has to be a little some factor below that. So, that will be the bandwidth. Okay. So, it is a little hard to uh, motivate it. I just have to kind of show you the solution and then analyze it. I do not like to do that, but uh, because we have not done transistors and not analyzed any transistor level amplifiers, we have to uh, we have to do that. Okay. So, let me before that let me go to something. A is a positive number. So, let us say you have a voltage controlled voltage source of gain minus A. Okay. And you connect a capacitance C from the input to the output of such a stage. Have you seen this problem before? Okay. Now, what I want is between 1 and 1 prime. I want some simpler equivalent circuit. Please evaluate it. That is, this whole thing is inside the black box, but let us say only 1 and 1 prime are the terminals brought out. Okay. So, I want to find some equivalent representation of what is between 1 and 1 prime. Extremely simple problem. If I apply V test here. Here I will have minus A V test and I will have A plus 1 times V test. Okay. So, across the capacitor you have much larger voltage than V test. So, through the capacitor you have a current which is A plus 1 times S C times V test that is the current drawn from here. So, basically it means that between 1 and 1 prime it looks like a capacitor which is whose value is C times A plus 1. Okay. So, in general this is true for uh, any impedance connected. Okay. Instead of capacitor let us say I had some impedance Z between them what would I see? Z, Z times A plus 1, Z divided by A plus 1 okay. because the current increases. right? So, essentially uh, if this voltage goes up by little bit this thing goes down by so much that across z you have a very large voltage so the current will be very large okay so you get a, a fraction of z as the impedance so this is uh, this phenomenon is known as miller effect and it can be either a problem or a feature that you can exploit sometimes and it doesn't have to be a voltage controlled voltage source it can be you can also do equivalent things with a current controlled source and so on current control current source okay now, one of the areas where it could be a problem is that, so let us say you have a negative gain amplifier okay, and there is some small parasitic capacitance or you think it is small. The capacitance may be small, but the current can be large because of this multiplication. Okay. So, it will look like a much larger capacitor in terms of the current that is drawn from the input side. Okay. So, that is why if you have a a negative gain amplifier you should also have good isolation between the input and output sides because if you have any capacitance between those two the capacitance could be small but if you have a gain of 1000 that will look like a 1000 times larger capacitance loading the input okay so that is a problem but sometimes you can also use it in the other way that is let's say you want a very large capacitor okay and it may be infeasible to realize or it may be too large to realize let's say too expensive to realize 
then you can try to do this ok. You can try to use a high gain amplifier and a small capacitor to emulate a larger capacitor ok. This is fine. So, sometimes it can also be a feature. Now, how is this relevant to what we are doing? Now, let us say I mean this uh, originally these two poles were at exactly the same frequency ok and you have to move the one of the poles by a large number. What would be the factor that you have to move it by? So, originally P 1 and P 2 are at the same frequency let us say. So, what is the factor by which you have to move the first pole? What is that? A naught by k basically it has to be more than that right. If the DC loop gain is 10000 then you have to move it by a factor of 10000 ok. So, it could be that this capacitor C 1 that you have to add it is quite large ok because you have to move the pole to a very low frequency. So, that means that you need a very large value of C 1. Then what continue the story please. What can we do now? Yeah. So, now if you look observe the second stage here right from V O 1 to V O 2 ok. For D C it looks like an amplifier of gain minus G M 2 R O 2 ok. So, it is not exactly the same as this in this analysis I assumed a voltage controlled voltage source. This is definitely not a voltage controlled voltage source ok. Well, at least for DC you have uh, negative gain and the negative gain also it is going to be a large gain. It may not be thousands, but it will be some 50 or something like that. So, I mean this is how you design stuff right by based on intuition after that you can use your analysis machinery to figure out what happens. So, instead of C 1 I will say hey, C 1 is too large I will put a smaller capacitor across a negative gain amplifier and then. Uh, so, that way I can use a smaller capacitor here C 1 prime to have the same effect. Does it sound reasonable? What I showed was if you have a negative gain amplifier and a capacitor between its input and output from the input side it looks like a much larger capacitor ok. And here is an instance where we do need a much larger capacitor and following that capacitor we do have a negative gain amplifier. So, hey the obvious idea if you knew all these things is to put together all the facts and say that I want to make this capacitor smaller. So, instead of connecting it between V O 1 and ground I will connect it between V O 1 and the output of the second stage ok. So, exactly the same thing is at play uh, if this voltage goes up this is expected to go down by a large uh, multiple of that. So, the cap current through the capacitor is large ok. Now, this is something that you probably know, but uh, I will say this anyway what import what matters for a performance of a circuit are currents and voltages right. So, if you let us say make some modification to the circuit, but Kirchhoff's law at every node is exactly the same as before nothing changes ok. So, this is one of the ways in which I mean this sounds too vague, but what I mean is you can take out some elements and put some other elements back, but let us say at every node the currents are the same. So, then obviously nothing else changes in the circuit also. So, many times this is how you design circuits. So, something is inconvenient maybe some element is too expensive or maybe uh, some element is causing some other problems you can try to mimic the effect of that by essentially drawing the current from that node which the element would have drawn. You do not need to connect the element any other way in which you draw the same current will give you exactly the same result. So, that is what we are using here ok. So, now will it work? Now, this also is not exactly the same as what we analyzed earlier we had a, an ideal voltage controlled voltage source now we do not. So, now you have to use your analysis machinery to figure out what the hell is going on ok. So, please do that before the next class it is also just to make the notations simpler without like multiple subscripts and so on. Let me call this C 1, C 2 and I will call this C C just to say that it is for frequency compensation ok. Now, what I want is V naught by V E and in the very first tutorial I had asked for uh, some format right. It is easiest if you write it as some DC gain times some numerator polynomial divided by some denominator polynomial ok. 
and please do this systematically and in case one of the easy ways of doing it is nodal analysis you take these two voltages as uh, variables v1 and v2 and write nodal analysis equations here okay so this is a 2 by 2 system right there are only two nodes in the circuit okay driven by a controlled current source so you should be able to write it as uh, some g matrix in this case uh, it's not g it's y y of s right g matrix times v1 v2 also functions of s and on the right side what should you have what is the general uh, format of uh, nodal analysis you have the conductance matrix times the unknown voltage vector equals equal current source vector so what is the current source vector here oops yeah where is the current source vector here i wanted v not by v e right where is the current source i have written the node nodal equations at this node and that node so what are the so the gm1 ve you can treat it as an independent source as far as this analysis is concerned after that you can pull it into the analysis right so the current being drawn out of this node is gm1 times ve so if you write it in the standard way you will get minus gm1 times ve which is the current pushed into that node and in the other node it is zero okay so you fill out all these entries this will be a 2 by 2 matrix and from this using kramer's rule and so on you can solve for the voltages this is probably the easiest way to do it you can do it in any way which way you want right you can do it in all kinds of ad hoc ways right kirchhoff's voltage law here current law there and do that but uh, because you have many elements connected together i think being systematic actually makes things easy right then see if the result is anything like what we expected it to be okay but please solve this what i want is the expression for v2 of s by v e of s i mean this is a suggestion but you are free to use anything you want and then put it in some reasonable form where you have the dc gain if there is a numerator polynomial if there is a denominator polynomial all of that should be like that 